Hi folks, welcome to the second keynote in uh, Sister. Um, uh, we, we, were, we were actually have two keynotes on, on disaggregated systems and today is the first one of them. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alexandra Sasha Fedorova. And um, uh, Dr. Fedorova did her PhD from Harvard in uh, 2006 where she worked with Professor Margot Silser. Um, uh, she interned at uh, Sun Microsystems Labs, where she contributed to the Niagara Processor Simulator, and worked with uh, transactional memory. And so since 2015, she's been a professor at the University of British Columbia, and she spent some time before that at SFU. She's won numerous awards, such as the uh, Anita Borg Early Career Award and the Alfred B. Sloan Research Fellowship. Uh, uh, Sasha, it's an honor to have you here at uh, Sister. Please take it away. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, just sharing the screen here. All right. Disaggregated systems meet near data processing. So before I begin my talk, I would like to acknowledge uh, my students whose work will be featured in the talk and also my collaborators from a company uh, of which you probably have never heard before, but you will after this talk. I also have to warn you that this talk will be will uh, be about some crazy new technologies that have just appeared on the market. So I recommend if you're in the early time zone, get yourself a nice cup of mild coffee. And if you're in the evening time zone, perhaps a nice cup of tea or a stronger beverage, if that is your preference. All right, storage, memory, and processing. We often think about these parts of system stack as being separate or even siloed. We think of storage as being persistent, slow, packaged as HDD or SSD, and being made of magnetic media and NAND flash, etc. We think of memory as volatile, fast compared to storage, and made of DRAM or SRAM. And we think of CPU as something that sits very far away from memory and storage and typically is stalled waiting from data to arrive from these lower levels of the system. We even have separate conferences dedicated to these technologies and separate benchmarks to evaluate them. Now, uh, there is a trend that is pulling these separate parts of the systems even further apart. And this trend is disaggregation. Disaggregated storage is something that probably most of us are familiar with, and disaggregated memory is a newer phenomenon. On the other hand, there is a trend in which these technologies are blending. So for example, Optane Persistent Memory blends memory and storage into a single device. Uh, we also have the blending of processing and storage, as in uh, OpenSSD uh, technology, and we also have processing in memory with companies like Upmem and Samsung making their offerings. So the thesis of today's talk is that even though these trends seem opposite, that blending can actually make disaggregation more practical. So the trend where these technologies are blending can make disaggregation, where they're being pulled further away from each other, more practical. So let's see how this can work. And this idea is less controversial in the domain of storage, so let's start with that. Disaggregated storage. So what this means is that our storage nodes are not directly attached to the CPU, via a fast bus such as PCIe, but they are connected via the network. And uh, we see the storage devices not as individual drives, but as an elastic array that can scale up and down inside depending on the needs of the compute nodes, and that can be managed separately. And we can have things like um, automatic failover, we can have replication, and all of this gives us better availability and reliability. Okay? So disaggregated storage has been around for at least a decade, even longer, and probably most of us use it every day. 
through uh, technologies like Amazon, uh, AWS S3, and, um, and in other cloud providers as well. So why has disaggregated storage become so widely acceptable? There are many reasons. Obviously, it's very attractive for the reasons of being elastic. But what made it possible is that um, the latency of accessing a directly attached device, which is, you know, in microseconds, if it's an SSD, I should say tens of hundreds of microseconds, if it is an SSD, is comparable to the latency of networks today. So if we do everything right, if we have fast networking interfaces, and if we um, optimize our software stack, we can also be in the tens of microseconds. The bandwidth, on the other hand, could be a problem if we have a bunch of CPU nodes uh, streaming a lot of data from storage nodes. Okay, so now let's look at processing and storage and see how that technology could help disaggregated storage in some way. So modern SSDs include general purpose processors and DRAM on board. So these um, um, items are included in order to manage FTL and um, you know to perform gar garbage collection and so on and so forth. So why not use them to run application logic? And indeed, platforms like OpenSSD enable research into uh, general purpose processing on SSD. And there are some very nice examples, uh, such as LightStore and more recent Rack SSD. That, uh, so Rack SSD, what they did is they actually implemented their idea in, in OpenSSD. And so th what they did is that they took a deep learning recommendation model that is um, the inference part of that model that is usually done in CPUs, and they offloaded the data intensive part of that inference to run inside SSD. So DLRM models can get very large. Um, some companies such as Baidu even report terabyte sized models. And so instead of pulling this, you know, potentially terabytes of data from an SS, uh, from from a storage array, disaggregated storage array, to the CPU, uh, processing this data directly on the device can can have certain benefits in situations where the bandwidth is limited. So you can see. I hope you you're starting to see how the idea of using the blending of technologies processing near storage in this case uh, can help disaggregated storage become more practical in situations where it is, you know, struggling perhaps with uh, bandwidth availability. But what about disaggregated memory? Disaggregated memory is, you know, conceptually very similar to disaggregated storage. So we have memory nodes and uh, we have CPU nodes. And memory, so conceptually, at a very high conceptual level, the memory is not attached directly to the CPU via memory bus, but is, it is located um, elsewhere in another enclosure and is, it is connected to the CPU node via the network. And this is still a very new idea in terms of uh, commercial deployment. For some, um, uh, for some folks in academia, this is, you know, a very uh, viable idea. There's certainly lots of uh, research being produced about it, but it's not yet um, quite accepted um, as a practical uh, computing technology commercially. So, in fact, I was actually giving a talk about, uh, you know, I was pitching my idea about disaggregated, that involved disaggregated memory, to a um, to a group of people in a quite a large company uh, that you know has many data centers worldwide, and you would think that you know they would be um, 
uh, they would be the first ones thinking of adopting this technology. And, you know, I finished my talk and there was a QA and a at the end. And I, I was giving it on Zoom. It was during the pandemic. And, you know, there was dead silence and everybody has their cameras off. And, you know, there's Q&A, but there are no questions. So really awkward. And uh, then after a couple of minutes, one brave soul turns on their microphone and says, disaggregated memory, doesn't it seem like a very bad idea? So let's see why uh, some people think it's a bad idea. And some people think it's a good idea. And let's see how processing near data can maybe make it practical. Okay, so you probably, um, you know, being systems people, can already see how uh, putting memory very far away from CPUs could be a very bad idea, right? Because of um, enormous l l latency. But before we address this particular challenge, let's first take a look at why anyone in the world would want to have disaggregated memory. So, um, memory utilization in data center servers is typically about uh, 60% on average. And so, what the and, and so if um, if we have memory attached directly to CPU node, then this memory is inelastic. So what we can have is the following situation: so in one CPU node has only 50% memory utilization, and another one has about 90, so it is about to run out of memory. And many systems these days are configured without swap, so when um, a system runs out of memory, the, the OS begins to kill applications, and it does happen a lot. So looking at this picture, at least, you know, I'm thinking, wouldn't it be nice to take the unused memory from the first node and give it to the second node? And then we wouldn't have to kill applications. And that is exactly the idea behind disaggregated memory. If we have the memory uh, separately in a, in a disaggregated array, we can have this elasticity, we can allocate memory more efficiently, we can have uh, better utilization and um, lower total cost of ownership in data centers. So let's look at some challenges with deploying disaggregated memory. So the biggest challenge is latency. When we have local RAM, the access time is in the hundreds of nanoseconds, depending on whether you have contention for the memory bus, but, you know, in that ballpark. If we put memory remotely on the network, that uh, goes up to tens of microseconds, and that is if you do everything right. If you use RDMA, if you bypass the kernel, use level networking, um, you know, InfiniBand, FastNix, yada, yada, yada. In, you know, according to published research li literature today, that's what I saw, tens of microseconds. Furthermore, if you have a bunch of memory in a separate array, you have to do memory management. You know, somebody has to decide, you know, how to allocate memory, how to free it, uh, keep track of mappings and page tables and all of that. Then some applications would like to see cache coherency uh, among CPU nodes when accessing this large array. So what are some of the solutions to these problems? Let's first talk about cache coherence. So, uh, a system Concordia, published last year, I guess this year in FAST, proposed to do cache coherence inside, um, inside programmable switches in the network. So a programmable switch keeps track of sort of a cache directory and performs cache coherence. Uh, most of the solutions, however, just do away with cache coherency altogether. 
Okay, now let's talk about the elephant in the room, which is the latency. As um, computer scientists, when a latency of accessing a remote device becomes high, what do we typically do? We use caches. And so most disaggregated memory solutions are not purely disaggregated, and CPU nodes do include some local RAM to be used as a cache for a remote disaggregated array. So these RAM caches are typically small, you know, four um, gigabytes is typical. So um, that is not, uh, you know, an excessive, an excessively large amount because, um, you know, on my system, just booting Linux uh, takes eight gigabytes of RAM and um, after booting Linux. And uh, applications can easily use uh, this tiny amount of memory, okay? Now, uh, if you do miss in the cache and you have to go to the, to, uh, to the uh, disaggregated memory over the network, in order to make this access as fast, uh, solutions typically use RDMA and one-sided operations where you can access remote memory without engaging uh, a CPU on the remote machine. It's like accessing memory over the network. Now, what about memory management? Oops, uh, sorry, before we talk about memory management, uh, let's talk about some other solutions to make uh, latency, uh, to, to address latency. And that involves uh, building some new hardware on CPU nodes. And typically what this hardware does is it piggybacks on an existing cache coherency protocol to, uh, to respond to local cache misses and fetch remote memory from remote, uh, from, from the disaggregated array. So um, initial solutions for disaggregated memory responded to local cache misses via page faults, and that is an expensive path and some of the newer ideas involve um, using hardware to respond just like you would to a cache miss. And the solutions involve uh, cache coherent um, FPGAs, where you have an FPGA that, that is a cache coherent with the CPU, and it can respond to cache misses and then go over the, net, the network and fetch your data from a disaggregated array. Okay, so let's talk about uh, memory management. Now, uh, some memory management solutions actually include a separate CPU node, uh, sorry, uh, actually include a CPU on each memory node. Okay, so there is a local CPU that um, manages memory there. And uh, that certainly simplifies management, but in some sense it makes disaggregated memory solution more expensive than it could be because now in each memory node you need, you know, uh, an expensive CPU and, uh, you know, CPUs use a lot of power, so you, you're using, uh, you know, there is a higher um, initial expense and higher power consumption when using the, the disaggregated array. Other solutions include um, centralized management where there uh, aren't CPUs in memory nodes, but there is a separate metadata server that does the, the memory management. And uh, there are also more recent ideas circulating uh, that are about performing memory management in the network using programmable switches, just like for cache coherence. So to summarize, the solution space that we have for disaggregated memory are, uh, is as follows. So for high latency, we add DRAM caches to CPU nodes, and we use uh, fast networking such as RDMA InfiniBand and uh, new hardware um, as well. For remote memory management, we uh, might add CPUs to remote memory nodes, or use a separate data meta, uh, separate metadata server, or perform in-network memory management.
All right, so now that we talked about disaggregated memory and why it might be beneficial and all the challenges that it has, let's switch gears and talk about processing in memory. So we'll focus on processing in memory for a few minutes, maybe 10 minutes or so, and then we'll bring, bring it back to disaggregated memory and see how it can help disaggregated memory solve some of its problems and become more practical. Processing in memory, or PIM, um, encompasses a broad class of technologies from embedding logic gates directly inside the memory fabric to putting processors closer to memory, also known as near data processing. And there is more than a decade of research uh, to some, according to some accounts, there is actually around five decades of research into this technology but most of them have not been built and certainly not commercially deployed. However, recently things have changed. Processing in memory technology is now commercially available. And there are a couple of technologies I want to mention and then we'll focus on one of them for the rest of the talk. Uh, Samsung Function in Memory is not yet available, it is coming up, and it is built for high bandwidth memory. So this is uh, high-end memory, expensive memory. It is truly for executing small functions inside, inside this memory. As far as I know, uh, you can execute uh, small up to 32 instruction snippets, and there is only a total of nine instructions available for you to choose from. So a somewhat limited programming model. And then there is another technology from UpMem, and what they have is a PIM-capable DRAM. So it's normal DDR4-compatible DRAM, but it has small general-purpose processors inside, and it is integrated into standard off-the-shelf servers. So I, I'm not aware of any research group having access to the Samsung uh, memory, but uh, there are several groups using the Upman memory today. And why am I highlighting that it is commercially available? I don't have commercial interest in this company. I'm not encouraging you to buy their, uh, their DRAM. The reason why I'm highlighting it is because the fact that it was actually built and integrated into off-the-shelf servers tells us something about um, viability of this technology and why it's interesting for research. If a new technology is evaluated in simulation, there are a lot of things that we don't know about it. So when we simulate things, we tend to uh, omit some parts of, um, of the system. So for example, simulators rarely consider how the new technology will be integrated into a standard uh, system. And so, for example, um, when you put a new memory into a system, you have to make sure that it meets the, it fits into the power envelope. And if you decide to build a PIM memory, but you put a processor that is, uh, you know, a bit too fast, then your PIM memory uses more power than you would like, and it doesn't fit into the power envelope, and it's not viable to, to build commercially. So that's one example. So the fact that they build it tells us that it's interesting to look at the constraints that they had to put on this technology in order to make it viable. And these constraints, of course, um, make this technology interesting from a research standpoint. Right? So we as researchers uh, want to understand and come up with new ideas about overcoming these constraints. So AppMem memory looks, it can be used just like regular DRAM. So you could buy standard off-the-shelf Intel server and you could just put that memory in and use it just like a uh, regular DRAM. However, each chip is equipped with small processors 
And so if you wanted to use these processors for computing, all you have to do is make small changes to the bias, install a kernel module SDK, and you're good to go. So let's see what's inside this computing capable memory. Each slice of DRAM, 64 megabyte slice of DRAM, has a processor attached to it. It's called the DRAM processing unit or a DPU. It's a general purpose processor, so you can program it in C and there is a compiler. It is simple in order and runs at a pretty low speed, 267 to 500 megahertz, and that is needed to fit the power envelope. There is no cache, it only has scratch pad memory, and the application has to copy data from the 64 megabyte DRAM slice into this scratch pad via a DMA engine. So, there is one DPU per each 64 megabytes of DRAM. So, if we have an 8 gigabyte DIMM, that would give us 128 DPUs. So, you, you see here that means that um, this stacking here on the slide means that there is a lot of these um, DRAM and DPU uh, units inside our DIMM. So what's important here is that each DPU has its own DMA engine. So when a DPU accesses the memory, it is not competing for the memory bus with any other DPUs. So together, many DPUs can achieve very, very high DRAM bandwidth in contrast to the CPU that would be limited by the memory channel. So let's take a look at, um, at the actual performance uh, charts to see how that works in practice. So this chart shows the throughput achieved by a very, very simple experiment. What we do here is that we take an array of data in memory and we, re we read every byte sequentially. So the blue line shows when we read the data using DPUs, DRAM processing units, and the more memory we have, the more data we're processing. So we have memory on the x-axis, the more data we're processing, and the more DPUs are involved, and the more DMA engines we have. Okay? So as we have more memory, we're achieving higher and higher bandwidth. Okay? So bandwidth scales with the memory size, bandwidth scales with the available data that we have to process. In contrast, if we look at the, so we have throughput on the y-axis, if we, lo if we uh, look at throughput achieved by um, DDR4 memory channel, so that's the uh, upper bound, uh, practical upper bound. Um, if we have only one channel, it's about 19 gigabytes per second and uh, four times that if we have four channels. So even if you have lots of powerful CPUs, you know, sitting and um, processing that memory and, you know, all of the prefetching going, that's the most you can achieve because you're limited by the memory channels. Okay. If you, if you have you know, more CPUs, you can add more memory channels, and we'll, we'll talk about that comparison, but still your scalability is limited by the number of memory channels, whereas if you're accessing that memory from DPUs, the more data you have, the more bandwidth you get. And that's one of the superpowers of this technology. Another superpower is low TCO, total cost of ownership. Total cost of ownership uh, consists of the cost to buy hardware and the cost to operate hardware. So let's look at both. So this table, we will uh, go through a simple exercise uh, of building a system to either minimize cost or to maximize bandwidth. And in some cases, we will use uh, just DRAM 
and in some cases and in other cases we will use also PIM capable memory in addition to DRAM so this column the third column would indicate whether or not we're using PIM and how much and we will look at bandwidth and cost so let's let's say that we had uh, a system with low bandwidth requirements in the first row here we have just DRAM a little bit of DRAM only 48 gigabytes and in the second row we also add just a little bit of PIM capable memory uh, 24 gigabytes so you can see that we can achieve a bandwidth of about you know 115 130 gigabytes per second but the cost of adding PIM basically doubles the cost of our system so at least from you know initial hardware purchase standpoint it's not very profitable for low bandwidth systems however if we now have a medium bandwidth system now let's imagine that we had a budget of about $6,500 and we wanted to build as high a bandwidth system as we wanted either using PIM first row here or using just DRAM now if we wanted to maximize bandwidth with DRAM we would need a more uh, a higher end CPU because we would uh, that would allow us to use more memory channels and we need to put um, more memory and so we would achieve about 500 gigabytes per second however if instead we use a little DRAM and then pack as much um, PIM memory as we can given the budget we can um, achieve 60% higher bandwidth 800 um, gigabytes per second roughly now if we look at very high bandwidth systems things get even more interesting so for a very high bandwidth system again so the last row shows the system with just DRAM and no PIM we need an even higher end uh, CPU and with that we're able to achieve about 1.4 terabytes uh, per second of bandwidth if we use PIM memory we're able to achieve the same bandwidth with less but look at the, at the price difference so the PIM memory uh, the solution with PIM memory is at least eight times cheaper than the solution with just DRAM now in terms of operational cost we typically look at power and a server with DRAM alone would draw about 400 watts a server with 128 gigabytes of PIM would draw about 700 watts so that's uh, that's a higher power consumption however when we look at actual performance we will see that for uh, bandwidth limited workloads PIM memory is also able to achieve a higher throughput so performance per watt is still likely to be higher with PIM memory and performance per watt is what we really care about alright so let's look at performance of some real applications um, that we uh, built to run on those GPUs the y-axis shows the throughput uh, relative to a single CPU this application here that I'm showing is uh, compression this is snappy compression we're compressing files and we're able to vary the input file size here on the x-axis and uh, so what's important to see here is that the the more data that we have to process the larger the file size the more DPUs we're able to use and so the more bandwidth we're able to have so our performance scales with the available bandwidth so more data more DPUs more DMA engines more throughput here's another example hyperdimensional computing hyperdimensional computing is a branch of AI that simulates human brain and what happens inside is computation is done on this hyperdimensional vectors vectors of very high dimension tens or hundreds thousands of elements and um, 
all you need to do is perform simple element-wise operations on those vectors. It's a great problem for DPUs, easy to scale across DPUs, and again, as we increase the file size, our uh, throughput on DPUs increases because we have more data, more DPUs, and more throughput. So I talked about advantages of this technology, its superpowers, but you know there wouldn't be any interesting research if it didn't have limitations. So let's talk about limitations. DPUs are slow. Like I explained, to fit into the power envelope, the, um, this, uh, the, the raw frequency had to be limited to up to 500 megahertz. They're simple, they're in order, they can't do floating point. So if you have floating point algorithms, you have to do quantization or something. There is no cache, so a program has to manually transfer the data from DRAM into SRAM. Now, uh, the very big limitation is that DPUs cannot talk to each other. There was a decision made by the company due to hardware and, and software complexity that there are no uh, communication channels between DPUs, even if those DPUs are on the same DIM. So each DPU sees the data only in its slice. So if, and like you saw in the previous uh, charts, you have to have lots of DPUs working together to achieve um, interesting performance. And so essentially it means that you have to have an embarrassingly parallel algorithm you, or highly parallelizable where you can chart the data across DPUs. Another limitation is that the DPUs store data in a different format than the CPU expects, okay? And this has to do with interleaving that is used on DRAM. So this is an illustration of how DRAM, wor uh, DRAM works. This is not to scale, just to give you the idea. So let's say that this is the first byte of a cache line. And a regular DRAM is writing that, um, so a regular system with regular DRAM is writing that cache line from CPU into DRAM. So what's going to happen for the reasons of speed is that the data, so, so those bytes are going to go to separate chips, okay? So the first byte is gonna go to the first chip, second to the second chip, third to the third chip, etc., etc. And this way we can write all those bytes in parallel and then when we read them, we can also read them in parallel. So that's um, why the interleaving is done to make DRAM accesses faster. But if you think about what happens with the data from the standpoint of an individual DPU, is that each DPU will see a different byte of data. So the first DPU will see the first byte, the second DPU will see the second byte, etc., etc. So no DPU will uh, see all the data contiguously. And so in order to, um, to avoid this problem that, you know, unless we have uh, very unusual algorithms that can compute on non-contiguous data, to avoid this problem that we can't, you know, run normal algorithms on DPU, what the CPU has to do is to de-interleave the data, basically rearrange how the bytes are placed in the cache line in order for each DPU to see the data contiguously. And so what this means is that if you want to have um, both CPU and GPU uh, computing on the same data, you have to copy, copy the data back and forth. And obviously, the CPU copies the data over the memory bus, and then we're back to this um, limiting bottleneck. So in other words, we prefer workloads where we can just place the data into the DPU memory and just leave it there and let DPUs compute in it and not let CPU touch it, okay? So to summarize, to make the most out of PIM, we need an embarrassingly parallel workload uh, 
we need low compute to memory ratio, no floating point, and little simultaneous access from the CPU. Okay, so let's bring let's bring this all together. So I told you that PIM is supposed to make disaggregated memory more practical. So what can we do if instead of regular memory we have PIM enabled memory memory blades? The most obvious uh, low hanging fruit is memory management. So now each GPU can perform memory management, it can run its own memory allocator, keep a local page table, it can even compress pages on the fly. So with this technology we're able to do memory management locally without adding an extra CPU to the memory blade. But you know this wouldn't be uh, an interesting keynote talk if we didn't talk about crazier ideas. So let's venture into the land of crazier ideas and let's talk about how we can actually address the problem of latency. So the reason why latency is such a challenge in disaggregated memory is that CPUs use load and store interface to access memory. Okay, And every instruction is potentially, uh, every instruction has to be loaded from memory and then about a quarter of all instructions also include uh, accessing additional data. So potentially you have one or two memory accesses on every single instruction. And that happens with a very fine granularity. And if we have to go, you know, across, potentially go across the network, uh, if our instruction data is not in the cache, that, that is a huge problem. So the crazy idea that uh, I will propose is that now that we have PIM capable memory, let, let this memory run entire applications or at least parts of applications. And if we do that, then we don't have to use this fine granular load and store interface to access memory. And then the latency will not be such a problem. Okay, so again, if we let disaggregated memory run applications or parts of applications, we can do away with fine granular load and store interface, use a higher level interface, and uh, latency will be less of a problem. Of course, this idea has many interesting research questions, and this is perhaps the part of the talk that is most actionable for you because I'm, um, I think most of you here are looking for new research ideas. So what applications can we effectively run on disaggregated PIM array? What interface do we use? And what do we lose and gain? So let's look at several uh, ideas of the applications and interfaces that can uh, hopefully set up a uh, a framework for thinking about uh, tackling these questions. In this period of uh, ML, which is um, you know very hot topic these days, let's look at deep learning recommendation models in PIM. Uh, like I mentioned before, deep learning recommendation models, so inference on those models, is a very bandwidth intensive operation. So. Inference is usually done on CPUs, and CPUs have to traverse large amounts of data to obtain only a small result. And so uh, when doing that, they're bandwidth limited. So what happens if we replace our RAM with PIM-capable RAM? And what happens if we do DLRM inference inside that memory. There is prior work that actually looked into doing DLRM either on an SSD, like I mentioned earlier, and also there was a proposal from uh, Facebook uh, called the RAC NMP 
that uh, were, were they um, designed in simulation and evaluated in simulation, a hardware that um, does DLRM inferencing directly in your memory, okay? So that was a custom hardware specialized for this purpose. So can we do this on this general purpose uh, DPU memory? So the challenges here is that some inference phases are compute intensive and you know DPUs are not very powerful. And another challenge is that our workload is skewed. So some parts of um, those DLRM models are more likely to be accessed than others. So achieving balanced parallelism across DPUs may be difficult. Let's look at another idea, graph processing in PIM. Some applications process very large graphs that often require distributed processing. And uh, there are lots of frameworks that are actually set up for distributed processing that partition the graphs and uh, process them in different nodes and then aggregate the results. So could we do this inside PIM memory? I think that's a really interesting and a very tough problem that hasn't been solved. So graph algorithms are not embarrassingly parallel, at least, uh, you know, algorithms of which I'm aware. We can partition the graph, but then we have to aggregate the results. And it's not clear whether this aggregation, which requires communication across GPUs via the CPU, whether it will be worth the, the benefit that we obtain by um, processing the data inside the memory itself. So that's a really interesting and challenging problem. And another one that I wanted to mention is a key value store that runs completely in memory. So what I'm showing here is a three tier setup where you have application servers that are doing uh, running some application logic and they require accessing database servers in the back end. Uh, but to alleviate database load, in the middle we have a cache layer that consists of cache servers and that are running in memory hash tables such as memcached or Redis or, or maybe others. So application servers talk to cache servers using the get put API. Now what if we replaced those actual, um, you know, traditional CPU-based servers with our PIM array without a CPU at all. And we would program it to respond to application servers via a get put API, which is a lot coarser grain than individual load and store instructions. So the benefits is that we could get rid of expensive CPUs in our caching layer save money and power. And it seems like it can be done because uh, those caching servers already shard data across different CPU nodes. So there is no reason, at least on the surface, why they can't shard it across DPUs. Now the challenges is that it's it's difficult to make sure that our GET requests are distributed nicely in parallel across all DPUs because we don't know uh, what the data, uh, how how the how the accesses to data will be distributed, and what we want is we want all DPUs to be working in parallel together, uh, and achieving that in in this uncertain situation can be difficult. So the reference that I have in the bottom is a similar idea that was uh, proposed for an SSD. All right, so we are running out of time. So it's time to summarize. What I told you today is that although disaggregation and blending seem to be like the opposing trends when disaggregation meets near data processing, these two trends can work together to make each more practical. And that concludes my talk.
and I am happy to take questions. Thank you, Sacha, for the great talk. Uh, so I think we have a bunch of questions on Slack. Um, I let Moshe go first with his questions. Moshe, are you there? Uh, I didn't have specifically any questions. More like we had a discussion because we thought this was a very interesting idea. That's all. All right. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, so, um, as we sort of like, you know, like uh, get questions going, uh, uh, Yitnak, did you have a question? Uh, <clears throat> yes. If you show your okay. slide with a key value store, one of the last ones. Yeah. What happens if you kind of squish together vertically so that you have, you can think of it as disaggregated, but really, instead of just caching a little bit, each uh, CPU node has part of the memory with PIM, if you wish. But that way, you get essentially a non, a possibly even dynamic NUMA, non-uniform memory architecture. So if you want, you can cache uh, spatially, bring things closer that you work with. Otherwise, at least for some of the data, you have it local. For the rest, you go across the network. Uh, so you seem to have most of the benefits of disaggregated, but when you don't really need tons of data, you, you have the benefits of local memory. I think that this would depend on this would depend on the um, the entire architecture of this three tier system. So what I was basing this off is of, of published descriptions of their three tier setup by Facebook, and they prefer to have this tier separate and to not do any caching in application servers perhaps because of um, some, at, at least as far as I know, uh, perhaps because of uh, maintaining coherency. So if you cache it locally, then if the, if the data changes, if the value becomes um, invalid, then you have to invalidate it in the, in the application servers. So, but there are probably applications where this is not a requirement and then surely having an additional cache locally will make even more sense as you pointed out. Yeah, I think at the beginning, your motivating example was an application that sometimes needs more memory than the local node has. And right. you said that, you know, on average only 50, 60% is being used and much of it is cold. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. For those cases, it's, coherency is not really an issue because you're not sharing memory in the sense of shared memory, shared content. Right. You're pooling the memory, the physical memory resource. Right. And and for that also, when you need to borrow memory, you don't borrow it for a microsecond. If you're borrowing 64 gigabytes from another node, it's not for a microsecond. Right. So the management is a non-issue. The management overhead. And you simply have part of your memory local because it's local. Mm -hmm. The rest you need to go over the network. And then whether you need to move, whether you want to move data so that the more frequently accessed is on the local node or not, that's, you know, it's an optimization issue. So I, I think there are really several issues here. One is uh, PIM versus non-PIM that is valid even on a single node uh, PC. Uh, for some applications. Then there's the disaggregation versus non-disaggregation. Mm -hmm. And then there's the issue of, uh, I like to call it pooling memory as opposed to shared content, yet a third issue. And sometimes it's really shared memory, like banging on the common database. Then you really need to worry about coherence. Right, you, 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 you outlined these uh, four issues uh, really well, and you're absolutely right. What I didn't mention about the disaggregated memory model is that there are actually a couple of ways to uh, to think about it. One way is that you know you have CPU nodes and memory nodes, and another way is where you have more of a peer-to-peer -peer system where uh, 
yeah. each CPU node also has memory and then but it can be a donor to another CPU node and give some of its own memory to to to, uh, to a exactly CPU. yes yeah there is definitely uh, this is definitely one of the models and I didn't talk about it for the time constraints but um, there is literature uh, about this model as well so thank thank you for bringing that up all right, our, our next question is actually from our keynote speaker from tomorrow, Kim Keaton. Kim, are you there? I am, can you hear me? Yes, go Excellent. ahead. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to say to Yitzhak, um, some of the issues that you just raised, we're gonna explore tomorrow in the keynote. So come on back and we'll have part two of this conversation. Um, so my question, Sasha, great talk. Um, my question for you is one that we were starting to talk about in email, but didn't quite get to. So I'm just wondering, based on your experiences um, with the UpMem devices, are there changes that you would advocate to future versions for DDR or maybe CXL or Gen Z to overcome some of the limitations that you uncovered? Yeah, so, so some of the changes that I'm currently advocating with the company don't even have to, don't even go as far as uh, DDR or CXL or Gen Z. And they have to do with the design that they are capable of changing, although, although one of them does cross into the DDR. So one limitation that I perhaps didn't highlight as much in the talk is that it is um, inefficient to control DPUs in DPUs individually. So uh, actually for their um, due to some hardware constraints, you cannot really control them one at a time because of how the MUX is positioned, telling the DPU whether to compute or to um, be ready for mem memory access. But at least from the point of view of hardware constraints, you can con control them in groups of two. However, for... Um, Okay, so because it would be inefficient to control them in groups of two, UpMem put a, rest a restriction currently that you really need to control them one rank at a time. So you can tell the entire rank of 64 DPUs, okay, now you're computing or now um, you're uh, set up to, you know, for memory access, uh, to, to copy data, uh, you know, in, into the DPUs or out of DPUs. And that is inconvenient from a programming standpoint, but I guess the upman did it to protect programmers for, from uh, doing something very inefficient, right? So it's a, it's a trade-off. I totally see why they made this decision, because programmers can use it in inefficient ways. Um, but of course, that, 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 that is one limitation that we're now you know, talking about whether it makes sense to lift it in software. Another limitation that is a that is a big one is lack of communication uh, channels between individual GPUs. If you want uh, to have communication across DIMMs, you'd have to make changes to you know DDR4 to you know to to protocols and and to um, to the external hardware. But enabling communication between GPUs inside the DIMM would be possible to to make available if the company chose to, uh, you know, to make their hardware more complex. However, one of the reasons, you know, besides extra cost and complexity, why they chose not to do that is that this makes the, the model, the, the mental model about how we think of uh, DPUs more, more complicated because, because now you have essentially, um, Sim what is similar to a NUMA type situation, but between DPUs. So two DPUs talking to each other is, you know, very fast. Then talking to remote DPU is slower. Uh, talking to DPU on a, on, a, uh, on a different chip is even slower. And then talking to uh, a DPU across DIMMs is even slower. And then talking to a DPU that is, you know, on a different NUMA node is even slower. So you have this, you know, hierarchy of latencies that is that could be difficult for programmers to grasp and to use effectively. So these are the two main uh, challenges that um, that we have been thinking about. Cool, thanks. thanks. All right, let's take two more quick questions and then we'll wrap up. The next question is from Yael. Uh, 
Yo, you want to go ahead? Yes, hi. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, yes. Galilar, University of Toronto. So a, a couple of questions. Uh, for, obviously, nice, very nice talk. I enjoy that. Um, the first one, I was a bit surprised that, uh, about the suggestion of using this technology for Memcached. Um, given your statement that you know the technology does best when effectively uh, operating uh, with memory that uh, or data that's already there, and you know something like a key value store is really mainly reading and basically data coming in and out. It doesn't really change that much, so it's a bit surprising. Um, I mean, I wouldn't expect it to really do that well. Um, and the second. Uh, question maybe, um, feel free to ignore the first one. Um, the, the way the architecture that you're presenting, you know, reminded me a lot of vector units. And uh, we have, uh, you know, hardware that, you know, effectively are vector units that work like this, they're called GPUs. Um, I was wondering, you know, you're comparing against, you know, just, you know, plain CPU. Uh, how well do you expect this to uh, you know, do against, you know, an environment where I may have, you know, multiple GPUs. Right. So um, we did do comparison with GPUs and um, there's more details in our paper. There is also another paper from Honor Mutlu's group um, that is coming up in the summer edition of Sigmetrics. They, ha they have a very de detailed comparison with, with GPUs. And um, obviously, there are situations where um, where GPUs will knock the socks off PIM in situations where um, the workload is very compute intensive. But there are also scenarios where PIM will achieve higher throughput because GPUs, like CPUs, are also limited by by the memory channel. So, for example, when we ran uh, the memory channel and and and, and also um, local resources uh, that are dedicated to uh, to the data pathway. So when we compared um, compression on DPUs versus GPUs, DPUs were faster because in uh, in GPUs where uh, where streaming multiprocessors share a cache, the cache became the bottleneck. And for, for DPU, so each one has individual scratch, but individual DMA engine, so that um, there is no contention on the data path. Now, to answer your first question, so the way this um, caching layer is set up is that it, um, so whenever there, so, 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 uh, so application servers before going to the database server, they always go to the caching layer to get a key. And if the key is not there, they get it from the database and they insert it into the caching layer. So the idea is that, um, you know, if, if, if this caching layer is managed well, of course, that it will have a high hit rate. And so most of the data will just sit there without, you know, being evicted and replaced by new data. And that is the main reason why we thought that this might be a good idea to explore as an application for DPUs. But of course, we haven't built it yet, so. If, if, I, if I may say, well, the data is there, it's basically just being read, right? So if the key is there, you just read it. What would the processor do other than just serve the data? So our idea is to not have processors at all. So just have a disaggregated PIM array that has no processors. And the reason for having no processors is to reduce cost and TCO. And the application servers would access um, the keys from this caching layer, just like they do now, but they will not be uh, but they will be using our DMA and directly get this data. Uh, and because there will be no CPUs on those caching... Let, let me rephrase by, by CPU, I really meant the PIM. So the, the processor and the memory, would it do anything other than basically just serve? Uh, oh, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, so it, no, it will not do anything, uh, anything other than serving, but... Um, 
uh, it does have to do some work in order in order to serve uh, a key because it has it would have to have you know some kind of hash table it would have to uh, find um, you know find the key and um, if there is eviction it would have to if if a value needs to be evicted it would have to perform the eviction you know decide where to um, where to put the value so so yeah the 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 work that will it will have to do will be simple but still it would be coarser grain than you know just uh, using individual load and stores yeah. thank you all right let's do one more question we'll wrap up uh from ven ven uh who had a question available ven ven are you there yes uh all right uh, this is one one yeah this is the one one from the university of georgia thanks for your great talk i've learned a lot uh, of team so my question is how do you see the potential of replacing the general purpose DPUs with domain specific accelerators? So I think there are both um, ideas, you know, being explored. So for example, the Samsung function in memory architecture that I briefly mentioned does exactly that. So instead of putting a general purpose processor into memory, they have put a domain specific accelerator for AI. So this function memory, I did not um, mention this uh, when I when I was alluding to Samsung, but it is actually targeted at AI. And I mean, certainly there is a there is an advantage there in that you can um, use this limited resources, so limited power budget, uh, limited space. You know, instead of making a general purpose processor that is uh, slow and has some other limitations, you could instead take these resources and make a processor that is, you know, very fast for a specific function, but can't really do much else. And, you know, it's not my place to, to tell which technology is better. I think it's, um, it's my place to explore it and um and understand the strengths and weaknesses and um and then time will tell which one will win but i think both of them are and will be explored thank you all right then uh thank you again so much uh sasha this was a great talk i'm sure the audience thank enjoyed you. it a lot <laughs> thank you for your questions and uh i will um i haven't been looking at slack but i will uh, wander off uh, there and uh, I'll address any other questions uh, that you have there.